Hey everyone, this lesson is on phenylketonuria. Phenylketonuria is an inherited disorder of phenylalanine metabolism. It is an autosomal recessive condition, which means that we need two alleles to actually have the condition. So if we were to take two unaffected carriers that have one of the phenylketonuria alleles, they are unaffected carriers because they only have one of the alleles. So the so big R would be the non-affected allele and little r would be the affected allele. So if we were to cross two heterozygous individuals and they were to have four children, one would have two big R's, so they would be a non-carrier, non-affected. There would be two of their children that would be heterozygous for the allele, but because it's a recessive allele, they'd be unaffected carriers, and they'd have one child with two of the affected alleles, which would lead to an affected phenotype. So the ratio is one, two, and one. So one non-carrier, two unaffected carriers, and one affected carrier, or you can think of it as three unaffected and one affected. The prevalence of phenylketonuria differs depending on the ethnicity. Within European groups, it's estimated to be one in 10,000, and for African groups, it's one in 50,000. Phenylketonuria is due to a deficiency of the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase, and the affected allele is located on chromosome 12, and it's generally in the location of Q24.1. And it is estimated that there are greater than 1,000 associated mutations that can cause phenylketonuria. So here's the pathway of phenylalanine metabolism. Phenylalanine is derived from our diet and it is processed by the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase into tyrosine. Tyrosine can also be taken up in our diet and processed by the enzyme tyrosinase in a separate pathway to produce melanin or can be processed by several enzymes into the catecholamines like dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Phenylalanine hydroxylase metabolizes approximately 75% of phenylalanine into tyrosine, and the rest of phenylalanine is usually utilized in protein formation. Now, phenylalanine hydroxylase is the enzyme that is deficient in phenylketonuria. There are several different types of phenylketonuria, classic, mild, but they all involve a deficiency in this enzyme, and some have a complete deficiency, some have just a reduced level of phenylalanine hydroxylase, but all of them can lead to increases in phenylalanine. Phenylalanine does not get metabolized properly because there is not enough of this enzyme present. Phenylalanine hydroxylase is the enzyme that is affected in phenylketonuria. Phenylketonuria, phenylalanine hydroxylase is the enzyme that is deficient in phenylketonuria. There are several different types of phenylketonuria. There's classic phenylketonuria that has a complete deficiency of this enzyme, and there's also milder forms with just reduced levels of this enzyme. But they all lead to increased phenylalanine uh, levels because there is either complete deficiency of this enzyme or there is a reduced level. So phenylalanine cannot be metabolized appropriately. So phenylalanine begins to build up. It can be processed by the enzyme phenylalanine transaminase into phenylpyruvic acid. So phenylalanine continues to build up. Phenylpyruvic acid also continues to increase in levels. And phenylpyruvic acid can actually cross the blood-brain barrier and actually lead to developmental delay in patients with phenylketonuria. The mechanism by which this does this is not completely known, but just remember that phenylpyruvic acid can cross the blood-brain barrier and cause developmental delay, generally in early life. Now, phenylpyruvic acid can also lead to the production of phenylacetic acid, and this can be excreted in our integumentary system and in the urine, and this generally leads to eczema, can also lead to a particular odor um, with patients with phenylketonuria. And because we're having reduced processing of phenylalanine by this enzyme into tyro uh, tyrosine, 
tyrosine actually decreases in level. So we can actually get some tyrosine from our diet, but some of it's actually from phenylalanine. So we actually have a reduced amount of tyrosine in phenylketonuria. This leads to reduced melanin formation, and generally patients with phenylketonuria also have hypopigmentation. So the presentation of phenylketonuria is as follows. When they're born, they are normal at birth. There are no issues. But what happens is early on in their life when they begin to consume foods with phenylalanine, they can't process it. They begin to have phenylpyruvic acid buildup. They can begin to have an odor, and this is generally described as musty odor. They also have eczema of their skin. They can also have tremors and developmental delay because of the phenylpyruvic acid entering the brain. And they also have hypopigmentation because they're having reduced formation of melanin. So with a developmental delay, they generally are described as having an IQ of less than 68 if they're never treated appropriately. With the hypopigmentation, they're described as having uh, fair skin and fair eyes, generally blue eyes and very fair skin. So how do we diagnose and how do we treat phenylketonuria? Diagnosis is through screening for phenylketonuria at birth. There's been a large push for screening neonates at birth for a variety of genetic conditions, and this is one of them, and this has actually helped to identify and to prevent a lot of these severe consequences of phenylketonuria. Once we diagnose phenylketonuria, treatment involves not eating phenylalanine. So we restrict dietary phenylalanine, and we start within the first 10 days of birth. Now there is some controversy as to how long we have to do this. Generally, it's thought that Restricting dietary phenylalanine until the end of puberty can be sufficient. It allows the brain to develop appropriately and will uh, individuals will live a, a normal life with normal cognitive function. Also, some evidence to show that perhaps we should continue to restrict dietary phenylalanine even into adulthood. With regards to individuals with phenylketonuria, if they become pregnant, it's a must that they also restrict dietary phenylalanine during pregnancy as well. And we also want to avoid some other things that we don't necessarily think about. One of those is avoiding aspartame. We do this because aspartame is hydrolyzed to phenylalanine, aspartate, and meth methanol. So again, screen all neonates at birth for phenylketonuria. We want to restrict dietary phenylalanine in those that are found to have phenylketonuria, and we generally do this until the end of puberty, and during pregnancy we want to do this as well. And we want to avoid aspartame, because aspartame gets hydrolyzed to phenylalanine. It can be kind of a hidden source of phenylalanine for these individuals. Anyways guys, I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Also, please check out my other lessons on metabolic disorders as well. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.